welcome to another episode of Cemetery Strolls. This episode, we're in Worthing. We're in Worthing in West Sussex. And we're at the Broadwater and Worthing Cemetery. A beautiful entrance. There's a memorial as soon as we come in. This memorial garden commemorates those who lost their lives in the Worthing typhoid epidemic in 1893. There's a nice big board up there from the friends of the Broadwater Worthing. We're here to see somebody specific. Um, if you've got children or had children and when you was a child you may well know this person. So we'll go to that in a bit. I'm not quite sure what this is. It's a broken, broken wall or something. Mm. So, I'll go through the arts, but these are the chapels and everything. Not much of a see when it is protected with netting and the pesky pigeons. But you can imagine it. We've got the, the board. Broadwater and Worthing Cemetery. Our main person, we're here. We need to go down to here. Okay. This one is Thomas Banting died. At Parade Lodge Worthing, 20th of June 1874. Thomas Banting, he was born on the 22nd of April 1799 in Westminster, the city of Westminster, Greater London, England, and he died the 20th of June 1874, aged 75, in Worthing, in West Sussex. Thomas Banting was a wealthy gentleman and the Banting family business was amongst the most famous firms of undertakers in Britain for most of the 19th and 20th century. Banting conducted the funerals of, among other notable pers uh, personages, King George III, King George IV, the Duke of Wellington, Prince Albert, Queen Victoria, and Edward VI. Thomas Banton seemed not to have been that much involved in the family business and moved to work in Sussex. After his death of his father, whilst his brother carried on with the business, he appeared to be an unassuming man and on his death left considerable sums of money to charitable causes, including setting up a charitable trust home for Worthing of gentlewomen of limited means. The trust is still in existence today but the house has long gone. Page 75. This is really kept well. Mary of Mary Roblin, born September 1796, died December the 12th, 1868. Kept really well. A lovely little one in the woods there. Yeah? I don't think there's anything here. It's in loving memory of Edward Evans, who died November the 22nd, 1881, in his 70th year. The trees are covering it, but let's see if we can. That's the outside of it. And these are the crosses that I was on about on the top.
It is a very large cemetery. Another two. Can't see any writing on it at all. We'll have a look around the side. Nothing there. Mr. Robin. No, nothing. On a sunny day, I bet this place is gorgeous. There's the other side of it in there. The cross is being broken, but in memory of Charles Dennis Potts Esquire, late lieutenant in must be His Majesty's 93rd Highlanders. Twenty ninth of March eighteen sixty six. It looks like age twenty or thirty seven. Thank you for your service, sir. Screw. It's got into a tree. Craftsmanship on this with the leaves and beautiful. In memory of Sarah, wife of Reverend W. H. Ball, died September the nineteenth, eighteen eighty one, age eighty five. Also, the Reverend Hal Ball. Formerly vicar of Billingshurst, which is in West Sussex. Doesn't say, it says when he was born, but March 1735, but could be 18. I can't get, no, I can't get it. We've got a, a broken column. Looks like a, a woodpecker. That's a bird. After research, I found out this is Colonel Gustavus Cowper Roxford, a member of Anglo-Irish peerage and direct lineage, descendant of Lieutenant Colonel James Prime Iron Roxford, a leading military commander in Cromwell's armies during the Civil War. He was executed in 1652 after court-martial following a duel when an opponent died of wounds after being beaten around the head by Prime Iron. Colonel Gustavus Powell Rosebud was in the Indian Army, 41st Madras Native Indus Infantry. His only daughter, Marble, married famous Dr. C. Lockhart Robinson. The broken pillar indicates a shortcut life. The base plinth is a version of the Rosebud coats of arms, a bird crest, and a robin red breast on top. Here we have a lovely memory of Ellen Horatio, dearly loved wife of Captain King, Royal Navy, of Vernon House Worthing, who fell asleep Sunday the 1st of May. 1881, and also Captain Williams King, Royal Navy, husband of the above, who died the 3rd of November, 1888, well it's my birthday, obviously not 1888, but uh, there's a little thing on, oh this must be the gentleman right here, this cross is, uh, Pickle, John Pickle, or Puckle, 
Of course, he's dedicated to the beloved memory of my husband, Lieutenant Colonel John Puckle, DSO Army Service Corps. Now she's placed of rest. So thank you for your service, sir. This must be the whole Puckle plot, actually. Because we have um, Richard Puckle Esquire. Yeah, so the uh, whole plot for the Puckles. This is a, a different one. With the carving on the top. It's in the form of a body as a cross. Obviously, it predicts uh, Jesus, but that is a different kind of way I've actually seen it. So, and it's memory of William Rupert Coltrane, DD. Peace for 33 years, Rector of Langdon, Spilsby. Wow. There we go. I won't get into there, I'm going to be going too far in, so. This is Richard Jeffries. He's an author and a naturalist. I'll do some more stuff when I've done my research. Richard Jeffries, 1848 to 1887. John Richard Jeffries, who died at Goran in August the 14th, 1887, age 38. which is Richard Oliver Lancelot, his beloved youngest child, who died March the 16th, 1885, age one year and eight months. John Richard Jeffries, born 6th of November, 1848, Swindon, in Wiltshire, England, and died the 14th of August, 1887, age 38, goring by the sea in Worthing, West Sussex. He was a novelist and naturalist. He was born at Cope Farm near Swinton and was employed early in his career at the North Wilkes Herald. At 16, he ran away with a friend intending to walk to Moscow, but they decided that language difficulties would debar that, so they elected to try America instead. When they ran out of money, they decided to return to Swindon. Some of the early novels, The Scarlet Shawl, Rentless Human Hearts and The World's End, his later novels of country life brought him enduring fame, Green Fern Farm and The Armalist at the Fair, 1888 and 1887 respectively, are full of his naturalist descriptions. One of his works, After London, 1885, has a remarkable present day theme the inhabitants of London have fled, leaving a poisonous lake that is now the city. The wild beasts and a mailing race of the wolf occupy most of England. Here we have 91588 Private BC Bridger, Royal Defence Corps, 14th of November 1918, age 42. We've got a few more in this section of our war heroes or fallen. A.A. Hearsman, 
leading seaman of Royal Navy Reserves 5704A, HMS Pembroke, 21st of October 1918, age 28. Thank you for your service, sir. I'm not sure if I'm going to go back and record these here. I don't think I recorded them before. If I have, then I'm wasting my time, but never mind. Better to have them than not. We have 9076 Private AEA Covey, Royal Sussex Regiment, 10th of December 1916, age 28. Thank you for your service, sir. Next to him, we have 71280 Lance Corporal HJ Greenfield, Knotts and Derby Sheriff Regiment. 31st of December 1918, age 36. Thank you for your service, sir. We have two together. We have 248138 Sergeant H. Rowe, Royal Engineers, 14th of November 1918, age 49. And then next to him we have. 65380 Private A.S. Farrell, Suffolk Regiment, 3rd of December 1918, age 19. Thank you for your services, sir. Let's see what else we can find on our walk through. We have another Commonwealth. This is 44292 Private J.H. Saunders, 3rd Reserve Regiment of Cavalry, 16th of March 1918, aged 18. Thank you for your service, sir. We have another one underneath this holly tree. Here we have. SO1750 Lance Corporal CH Waller or Waller Royal Sussex Regiment 14th of November 1918 I've seen a few from the 14th of November 1918 from the Royal Sussex so it must have been a bad bad day for the Sussex it's something worth checking up on I suppose Have a large one. Let's see what we can read. Thomas Graham. Thomas Graham Graham, born in the year 1824 in Coventry, Metropolitan Borough of Coventry, West Midlands, England. And he died on the 25th of December 1905, aged 80, 81, in Worthing. In West Sussex. Thomas, Thomas Graham Graham was almost certainly a man of some means. Born in Coventry, then in Warwickshire, he had by the 1840s moved to Sampson, Cornwall, possibly around 1835, and he had inherited land and property from a great uncle, although he had yet to source his property at the time of his marriage the 30th of April 1850 to Jane Hill. He was the owner of a substantial house named Penquite, which stood in grounds of over 230 acres. This house later became famous when it was rented by Colonel John Whitehead Peard. It was visited by Garibaldi, who was visiting his friend the Colonel, framed as his Garibaldi's Englishman. The house will stand, is still standing today as listed building currently owned by the YHA. Thomas Graham was serving as a justice for the peace in the early 1850s in London. The London Gazette noted in 1852, 1854 and 1855 that the Prince of Wales Council Chamber Somerset House appointed almost another Thomas Graham of Penquilly Esquire as Sheriff of Cornwall. Later, 
Thomas left Cornwall during the late 1850s, although he still remained ownership of Pink White and moved to Sussex where in 1861 he is recorded as living at 12 Park Crescent Worthing with his family and staff of five. He may have sold Pink White around 1870. In 1871 he had moved to Trevor House where he remained until his death as noted on his tombstone census record described he is a landowner living of his own means. His son George Edward is a farmer living in the High Downs Towers in 1881. The Natural Archives show that after his death various land he owned in Cornwall was sold off by his trustees. Graham, late of Trevor Worthing and formerly of Pinkwhite Cornwall who died on Xmas Day 1905 at age 81. Also Jane, Jane his wife who died 26th of August 1893 age 66 and Mary Jane Graham eldest daughter of the above who died 20th of November 1888 age 35. We've got one eight three zero six first Ed Mechanic C D W Pomeroy Royal Air Force eighteenth of July eighteen eighteen nineteen eighteen age twenty eight. Thank you for your service, sir. There are some beautiful stones. Some aren't recognisable, I mean. Look at that. That is weird. That looks like it's actually been eaten by ants or whatever, but it's William Cooper. That's all I can see on it, but that's weird. It's like, I don't know, like a, a, a nest. Is weird. We have another. One of our fallen. It is 539 Private H. Dub H. F. Parsons, Royal Sussex Regiment, 28th of January 1916. Thank you for service, sir. It is beautiful. I want to see, it says Molly, age 6, 16, no fucking, yeah there it is, Molly, age 16, 11th of May, 1912, 5th of January, 1928, Yes, yeah, a 16. Daughter of Max and Veronica Corbett. There was something written here. Ah. In love and memory of Maxwell Campbell Corbett, 5th of December 1888, 23rd of June 1944. Beloved husband of Veronica Corbett. When I do leave here, nobody is to come with me, nobody is to attach themselves to me. But I felt somebody. Unfortunately, well, Veronica's not here. That's sad. Here we have William Henry Hudson, scientist, author, naturalist, and woofer. Yeah, another ologist. I'll write it down. Orphanologist. He was born in Argentina and died in London. William Henry Hudson. 
Born the 4th of August 1841 in Buenos Aires, Argentina. He died the 18th of August 1922, aged 81, at Notting Hill, Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, Greater London, England. He was a scientist, author, naturalist, orphanologist. He was born in Argentina and died in London, England. He is best known for his books, Green Mansions, The Purple Land, The Naturalist in La Plata, The Shepherd's Life, Far Away and Long Ago, and A Hind of Richmond Park. His epitaph reads, He loves birds and green places and the wind on the heath, and saw brightness in the skirts of God. In other memory of Ada Lillian Jones fell asleep 21st of February 1957, age 56, and her husband William Jones reunited 24th of December 1964, age 74. Beautiful. Nice to see it still looked after as well, it's lovely. This is PR Funnel, Yeoman of Signals, Royal Navy, 208436, HMS Greenwich, 20th of January 1921, age 37. Thank you for your service, sir. The dear memory of Giovanni Alderman died the 29th of December 1917 of London and Littlehampton, born in Berliga, 22nd of February 1843. And then is his wife, Emily Mary Alderman. Died the 23rd of July 1930. It's beautiful. It's a lot of Giovanni Alderman. He is a, a musician uh, in the Victorian era. Um, he played like the violin. He was a singer. Uh, he sort of went back into. Um, to Milan, he also played at Crystal Palace with uh, Tino Martini, a pianist with the King of Italy at the time. And um, he was a, a high-class person of his time. By the sounds of it, he got involved with big um, companies such as the uh, Alfred Gilbert and the Coal Sisters. He was um, also a, a, a teacher in London at the arts. Um, but he, he had a bit of a, a bit of a twist. You know, his, the tale, however, has a twist to it. On the 25th of March, 1885, the bachelor Giovanni got married. His bride was one Miss Emily Mary Nelda. She was uh, born in New Inn Yard, the 1st of February, 1851, and died at Mill Hill Park, Acton. 27th of July 1930. He was uh, born in Shoreditch, a daughter of a coach tremor and herself, a menial mantle maker. Millie's father absconded and her mother remarried thrice between 1866, a divorce in 1870. An auctioneer named Alfred Campion, and the next time I uh, spotted Millie was living in Acton, supporting three servants, including a coachman. To what did she owe this huge rise in prosperity? And the prosperity the Alderman lived on in Acton with the Gagworth servants and when Ellie Emily Alderman died in nineteen thirty she left a vast fortune in over twenty thousand pound. So imagine Signor Good Giovanni didn't need to sing for his supper when he died in nineteen seventeen. 
it didn't make the press. I guess there was too much more going on at the time. Giovanni wrote a few songs, two of which, Guardian Angels and Consider the Liddies, found from some success in Twilight Shadows. O rest thee, babe, please yourself. The reason why, the swing, Una Cosa, Weeping and Waiting, and several pieces of violin and piano music also came from his pen. There's this one. The Celtic Cross, you know me. And then this is George Neville Strange, died the 19th of July 1919, aged 47. Can't really see them after, I always have trouble reading off of them. The clumped section there, difficult to get to. A lot of it are sort of overgrowing. You could probably do with a, a bit of tender loving care this place. I understand, you know, we all understand that like the friends of the cemeteries and churchyards, they are volunteers. But Robert Henry West died March the first, nineteen ten, in his seventy third year. And Harriet, his wife, died February the 21st, 1910, age 76. Well, so she must have passed first, and then no longer days after, a week after, he passed. That's sad. It's been chipped away at the wing, the arms, the reef. William Joseph Cager, age 49. And children's ones there. That she's been knocked off. Some people. It's a busy place in there. Wish I could get in there. There's no way. We may find a way through, but there's a nice one out there, we're going to have a look at that in a minute, but I've just spotted the War Memorial. And I do like to pay my respects, oh we've got a path down here, whenever I'm near War Memorial. In the honoured memory of those sailors and soldiers who gave their lives for their country in the Great War of 1914 to 1918, died beneath this cemetery. Let's see if they've I don't think they've got one here for World War Two, no. Like I said before, I don't normally do modern ones, but 
This looks like somebody who loved the, the Scouts and the Algene pilot. 22nd of February 1992 to the 5th of December 2008. Danielle Jean Pilot, born the 22nd of February 1992 and passed away on the 5th of December 2008, aged 16. As I said before, I don't normally do uh, modern day um, Graves, but after I read this little story, I thought to myself, you know, this young lady needs her story told. Danielle died from a rare heart condition after becoming stressed whilst looking after her baby doll. Danielle Pilot, 16, was tasked with caring for after the model infant as part of an assignment at Sussex North Holt, Northbrook College but she became highly distressed and exhausted after caring for the doll for just 12 hours. After repeatedly being woken every hour during a tormented night's sleep, Danielle slipped into unconsciousness and died just hours after returning the doll to her child development tutors in December 2008. The simulators are fitted with external computers to make the baby cry at random intervals to give teens an early taste of parenthood. Her father, David Pilot, told his daughter's inquest that Danielle appeared pale and suffered from a rare pulse after caring for the baby. A racing pulse, sorry. It was very, very stressful and in the morning she looked like a new mum herself. A question whether someone with her heart condition should have been given one of these virtual babies. But the inquest also held, heard that Danielle's condition meant she could have died at any moment. An autopsy showed that her heart muscle had thickened due to her condition. Stress and anxiety from the baby are factors that could have worsened her condition, but it would have been speculative to say that it was definitive cause of the events that happened the following morning. The cause of the death was officially recorded as natural cause stemming from heart irregularities. Sing peace, young lady. We've got Janet Fraser, painter, who died December the 8th, 1904, age 47, and Edmund Painter, who died April the 10th, 1919, age 64. Major Charles John Gilbert, late second battalion of the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, surviving son Edward, Reverend Edward Gilbert, vicar of Hidingston, Northamptonshire. Thank you for your services. Now this is something. This is my first one, my first mausoleum I've ever seen on and done on the channel. And it's AA Rally, Rally. And it's the beloved memory of Emily, beloved wife of Alexandra Antonio Rally who died the 25th of May 1902 in the 58th year. Big metal door. And also Alexandra Antonio Riley, who died on the 17th of September 1916 in the 77th year. But yeah, that's lovely. And these are certainly prominent. Lovely yew tree. It looks like it's been having a good old cut back, but she's still growing. And the one next door. 
there's plenty of squirrels if we look on that tree we can zoom in see one sat there doing on his nuts A lot of the areas are quite uniform. Yeah, yeah that, there he is. See, we're not allowed these on the Isle of Wight. They have to be reported, either caught and released on the mainland or they have to be executed. Put some graves there. Metal crosses on them. I'm wondering whether they're from like uh, the sisters or brothers in the nunnery or the monastery. Yeah. That's different. It's obviously been laid down. See that, that's all. But that's, that's beautiful. Obviously, we know that means a short life. Let's see if we can actually find out, shall we? We've had a short life, so let's have a loving memory, my dear husband, Frederick Henry Denning. He died the October the 22nd, 1892, in his 36th year. It's a different kind. I don't know what it is, but I can't read it. We have here 15949 Corporal HC Forest, Army, Army Cyclist Corps, 5th of December 1918, age 25. Thank you for your service, sir. You can see this is all overgrowing. It's a shame. It's so nice stuff in there. But I'm not willing to trip myself up. Now, this is the grave we've come to visit. This is Mary Hughes. Not a household name. It's a childhood name. Mary is loving memory of our dear mother Mary Hughes who passed away December the 9th, 1931 on her 91st year. Heroin of the nursery rhyme, Mary had a little lamb. She's where she rests. I'll put the story, I'll talk the story through later on, but yeah, Mary had a little lamb. And this is where Mary lays.
Mary's father, John Thomas, was a sheep farmer in the Vale of Congolan. Mary attended the British school in Brook Street, Congolan, and one day, one of the lambs she had reared by hand as pets followed her to school, where it caused such a commotion that the teacher, Mrs. Coward, made her remove it and tie it outside to a nearby toll gate. Sarah Joseph Bull, who were visiting the area at the time from London, were so amused by the incident that on her return home she penned the poem, Mary Had a Little Lamb, that later became the well-known nursery rhyme. Mary, in her later life, moved to the south of England, where she died in Worthing on the 9th of December 1931-89. To commemorate her life and the lamb, a lamb has been cut in relief on the simple headstone of a grave. Now at the end of this um, video there's going to be the reading of the full poem, um, nursery rhyme, um, with bloopers. Right, to the memory of Alfred Blythe Kent, died November the 22nd, 1902, age 72. As you can see, it is a proper crowded place. Lots to discover, no doubt. But... I've got far too much to do for other places to visit. We're now just coming back up to where we we started, basically. The rain just starting to drop. Right, so I think I think that's it here for the Broadway and Worthing Cemetery. We found a nursery rhyme idol. We found authors, plenty of squirrels. As we can see, there's more here now. The imp just running away. Pesky little critters. Literally hundreds of them. Right, so don't forget to like, subscribe, leave a comment. I do reply back to all comments. You know, if somebody's willing to spend time to message me, then I will comment back. So I thank you much, Lee. And, uh, I look forward to you joining me for the next episode of Cemetery Strokes. <laughs>
just going to ask Raccoon Red to read the nursery rhyme, Mary Had a Little Lamb. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. He followed her to school one day that was against the rule. It made the children laugh and play to see the lamb at school. And so the teacher turned him out, but still he lingered near, and waited patiently about till Mary did appear. And then he ran to her and laid his head upon her arm, as if he said, I'm not afraid, you'll keep me from all harm. What makes the lamb love Mary so, the eager children cry. Oh, Mary loves the lamb, you know, the teacher did reply. And you each gentle animal in confidence may bind and make it follow at your call if you are always kind. And so Mary is dead. Do not try to explain it to the little children, for they will not believe you. They will tell you that she has gone away to play among the lambs she loved so well. So Mary is dead, and yet she will never die. Her memory will go on forever immortal. When she was about six years old, a little lamb followed her to school, frolicked until the mistress turned him out. That is why Miss Buell, who was visiting the farm at the time, wrote the little verse. Probably even now, a little child is murmuring it through or is lip syncing it to its daddy for his approval while children live and play it and never die. And that would have been the end of the video until while I was editing I found these. Mary had a little lamb, her father shot it dead. Now every day it goes to school between two chunks of bread. Mary had a little lamb, she strapped it to a pylon. All the volts went up its butt and turned its wool to nylon. Mary had a little lamb, she also had a duck. She put them on the mantelpiece to see if they'd make friends. Mary had a little lamb, she kept it in a bucket. What are you doing? Practicing the one that I